Okay, so th thanks very much for having me. And this is uh, joint with kind of uh, our stealth participant here, uh, Vernon Henderson. Uh, yeah, so he's, uh, he's clearly very influential here. Uh, uh, Lauren Brandt, Matt Turner, and Ching-Hua Zhang. Um, so I want to think about how uh, the really um, large uh, expansions in the transport infrastructure in China since 1990 have influenced urban growth and, and really focusing on changes in urban form in Chinese cities. Um, so in kind of thinking more generally about how transportation can influence urban growth, we can kind of think about transportation infrastructure in cities as kind of part of the city's capital stock. And there may, as a result, be direct influences on firm productivities. Um, that's, you know, one, one mechanism. But then more transport infrastructure in a city also essentially allows the city uh, to be bigger spatially, keeping uh, aggregate travel time or travel costs the same, and that allows it to accommodate more people, more firms, uh, more economic activity, and as we know, you know, as urban economists, the more people you put in the city uh, through agglomeration economies, the, the more productive each person can be. So there's kind of that, that mechanism as well. That's holding urban form constant, though. I think another important mechanism is that uh, more transportation infrastructure, uh, especially from the base that you saw in Chinese cities in 1990, which was basically nothing, uh, was, uh, facilitates more efficient urban form. Um, so in particular, we'll see how uh, in Chinese cities, industry, uh, especially industries that produced, uh, produce light and medium weight products, uh, move to the periphery uh, with railroads and ring roads, uh, freeing up central city space for more service-oriented uh, type production activities um, that benefit more from economies of density and proximity that, 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 that benefit from such agglomeration economies. Um, and uh, we'll also see how highways um, facilitate decentralization of population, essentially allowing cities to accommodate more population uh, during this period since 1990 when there's a lot of urbanization going on in China. Okay, so that's, oops, not yet. And then finally, uh, more highways can facilitate better trading links to nearby areas. Um, and so, so I'll try to think about that a little bit at the end. Okay. Uh, so specifically, uh, I'm going to spend most of the talk talking, trying to understand how transport infrastructure drives urban spatial form. Um, and I'm going to show you estimates of the effects of highways and rail networks on decentralization in Chinese cities since 1990, looking at various uh, aspects of, of, of these networks. So radial versus ring uh, versus total kilometers of railroads uh, and highways. Um, and I'm going to examine effects on population, industrial GDP, and employment location in various uh, manufacturing industries. And I'm going to break them out kind of by uh, shipping costs and weight to value ratios. Okay? Um, and so you, know, you worry in doing this sort of analysis that uh, highways were built, uh, railroads were built in places that were doing well economically, maybe partly because these, this transportation infrastructure was uh, at least partly locally funded, or the, the government, the central government's trying to support successful cities, and so we want to have some source of uh, at least plausibly exogenous variation in the allocation of, of this transport infrastructure across cities, so we're going to use uh, instruments that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later from uh, uh, the earlier planning area uh, era, uh, allowing us to, to identify plausibly causal effects here. Okay. So, as a motivation, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, interest in the development community 
uh, in, in the policy community in, in transport infrastructure, and it amounts to a lot of uh, lending by the World Bank. Um, and you see in developing countries, you know, China is just one of them. India is building a national uh, highway network as well. But in China, there was over $200 billion in investments per year uh, since, you know, over the past 15 years or so, 20 years, in uh, transport infrastructure and much of that in cities. Okay, so it's just there's this huge growth going on. And I think it's important to understand what the effects of it are and try to have some, uh, some idea of, of how they're changing uh, the urban landscape. And you know, this is, this is really gonna shape cities for a long period to come. Um, and there's not a lot of evidence about, about the effects of transport infrastructure in developing countries. So you know, from a planning perspective, uh, you'd like to, to be able to, to plan uh, uh, cities of the future, and in order to do that, you've got to know how uh, transport infrastructure affects urban form and different types of economic activity, the location of different types of economic activity, and also know which types of transport investments uh, and which elements of the network uh, uh, impact different outcomes and how. Okay, so I think, you know, I hope the Chinese experience will be policy relevant for uh, other countries that are uh, getting underway and in, in improving their, their, their transport infrastructure and are urbanizing rapidly like China has. Um, so, you know, China has this particular kind of context which is important. Um, there's, there's this food security issue that came up earlier uh, in Lakshmi ta Lakshmi's talk uh, that's, that's kind of uh, worried about by, by government officials there that, you know, you worry that if uh, uh, that you want to maintain as much agricultural land as possible, you know, as possible, and if cities grow, that's going to infringe on agricultural land. So it's important to understand how, how much of an issue that is. Um, and then there's some environmental questions. Um, and then there's a the question about economic growth, which I think is you know, the bigger one for, for a general uh, research community. You know, how do we facilitate the uh, transition of central cities from sort of an industrial-oriented economy uh, as countries develop into a more service-oriented economy uh, where information spillovers can operate? Um, and so certainly in in China and in many other uh, developing economies, you find this, this spatial configuration in cities where you have industry uh, located in city centers. Um, in China, this was kind of by uh, government edict, uh, by you know, Mao said this is the way things should be. Um, uh, and however, in some sense, from an urban economics pers perspective, it seems uh, reasonable if the only way to ship things is via some town, downtown rail hub, but doesn't make much sense if you can substitute with different types of rail infrastructure or, or transport infrastructure for that rail hub and uh, encourage kind of more different types of industries that benefit more from agglomeration spillovers to operate downtown uh, instead. Uh, in particular, industry, you know, we, we tend to think doesn't have uh, such strong agglomeration spillovers. It tends to be pretty land intensive. Um, and labor is cheaper in, at, at urban peripheries. Um, and industry also tends to employ less skilled labor than more service-oriented industries. And that, that, I think, is kind of related to the, uh, to the strength of the agglomeration spillover or, or the, the less, the weaker agglomeration spillovers that exist in industry, okay? Um, so, yeah, so, so, and this all feeds into to, to thinking about the extent to which transport infrastructure facilitates urbanization by promoting urban economic growth and, in the end, national economic growth, which, which and the two go together in a developing country context. 
So how do, you know, what's been done before in this regard, uh, Faber uh, looks, and Banerjee, Duflo, and Chan, they look at kind of economic growth uh, as it relates to infrastructure in rural Chinese counties. Um, and uh, so, and Donaldson looks at uh, kind of the effects of uh, railroads in uh, colonial era Indian cities. Um, so we kind of, I think we have a context that's different from uh, other work in, in developing countries. And that's actually maybe more relevant for where most of the population lives now and, and certainly where it will live, uh, you know, 20 years down the road. So China is urbanizing quickly. Uh, already more than half the population is urban, okay? There's a literature also that uh, I uh, have a history in looking at the effects of transportation in U.S. cities. Um, and, you know, I, that kind of looks at how transportation has caused decentralization and growth, uh, uh, economic growth in U.S. cities. Um, and so I think, you know, the two things we bring to the table are looking at a pretty rich set of uh, measures of, ne of transportation network uh, and a rich set of outcomes. Um, industrial GDP, population, and employment by industry. Um, there's also some case studies that look at kind of the process of industrial decentralization as countries um, uh, develop. And this sort of industrial decentralization actually occurred in the U.S. as well in the 1950s. Um, in 1960s, and Meyer, Kane, and Wool in their kind of classic book, The Urban Transportation Problem, talk about this as well. Uh, it's not up here, but I should, have, I should put it up here. But there's kind of uh, this standard narrative that as countries develop, you get this decentralization of industrial activity. Okay? Um, so we're going to show that systematically in the data. Okay, so I'm going to show you results that indicate that each radial highway displaced about 5% of population uh, from central city areas to uh, urban peripheries, we can think of as suburbs. Um, but highways had no significant effect on the location of industrial production. Um, and, but among manufacturing, uh, there was decentralization of textiles, apparel, and leather production, very, which are very light things that can be shipped easily long distances by highway. Okay. Um, conditional on kind of the number of radial highways, it doesn't seem like kilometers of the network matter. Um, railroads matter a lot for uh, location of industry. So each radial railroad displaced about 26% of central city industrial GDP. Um, but not, no population, okay? And medium and especially lightweight industrial production uh, also responded quite, quite a bit to, to radial railroads. And I'll show you some the exact numbers on that later on. And then ring roads displaced pretty much everything except heavy stuff. Though we're gonna find some large standard errors here and there, so sometimes it's gonna be hard to interpret, okay? No, there, we don't have enough cities with uh, subways to do that. Um, so we don't really have the variation there. And we also don't have the, <coughs> we, we don't know how to instrument for that either. Um, so we're going to be looking at so-called city propers in 1990 uh, as our definition of central cities. Uh, for cities that did not exist yet uh, as prefecture level cities in 1990, we're going to use uh, the first definition when they were promoted. Um, and we're going to use 2005 definition prefectures as kind of uh, the, the larger unit of analysis, that, that the, the difference of which is going to make up the suburbs. Um, so you had this big uh, migration, of course, going on during this period. Um, a lot of it uh, within prefectures, you know, from rural areas to urban areas that we're going to have to, to think about. And there's, you know, very rapid GDP growth. 
and a baseline of almost no highways in 1990. Okay? Uh, Almost everything was shipped by rail in 1990, and that, that's kind of going to be going to be the baseline we work with. Okay. Oops. Oh, I, I, it works now. Okay. So, in the early 1990s, you know, 1990 forms a good base year. One because there was very little, uh, there was no highway infrastructure in 1990 yet, um, and two, it was it's before it, any of the, the urban land reforms uh, occurred. Um, and so, kind of cities were still uh, totally planned uh, from it, you know as of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so there had been very little changes in cities uh, for for a long period. And so, as a result, cities couldn't really decentralize before 1990 because there were no there was no market for land, and people tended to live and work. Uh, uh, in the same uh, complex. Uh, so commuting didn't start in a big way until, uh, until the 1990s. Um, and so after the land reforms, it was possible for factories to sell off land and move to ex-urban areas. Um, uh, and we see a lot of that. Okay? And so as a result, the cities changed quite a bit. Okay, so this is our study area. Um, we have 1990 central cities for uh, 257 prefectures in our sample, um, and then surrounding them are the, are the prefecture remainders in yellow. Okay. So there are 286 prefectures for which we have data. We only use 200, the 257, which uh, have cities, uh, core cities of over 50,000 in 1990, uh, and that uh, had some area surrounding it to de that, that decentralization could have occurred into. So we're going to use information from, from the censuses, 100% count of censuses in 1990, 2000, and 2010, uh, industrial employment from the 1995 and 2008 industrial censuses, um, and uh, GDP from uh, Michigan Online and some printed uh, yearbooks uh, that have been collected in Beijing. Uh, so that means we have a smaller sample of 241 cities for the GDP uh, information. So one of the issues that we have to deal with is that the spatial extent of what is administrably, uh, administrably the city uh, expanded geographically over time. So here, Beijing. Uh, expanded into this yellow area since 1990, and we're going to keep just the, the green, which is the 1990 definition. These dots are the CBDs, um, and uh, these, uh, so the data comes indexed to these uh, regions outlined in light blue, which are either urban districts or rural counties, which we aggregate appropriately. Okay. So just back to lights at night, <coughs> Looking at lights at night, you, you really see the economic growth that occurred uh, in the Beijing area, and you see that all over China. Um, and you know, uh, this is one outcome measure that we kind of can kind of use to get a sense of what was going on that has the advantage of being comprehensive and has the disadvantage that, that it's somewhat hard to interpret. Uh, but uh, in any case, you look at lights growth you actually see more rapid lights growth in prefecture remainders than in central cities uh, during all of our, during you know, any part of our sample period uh, and the full sample period overall. On the other hand, you see much more rapid population growth in central cities than in prefecture remainders. And a lot of this, or you know, most of this, is rural urban migration. Okay. Yeah, uh, no, prefecture remainder is uh, anything outside the green. So it could include yellow or white. So this is just because the green things are, are the 1990 definitions, and some data only comes for that green area in 1990. So we kind of uh, want to keep our geography constant over time. Okay. 
looking at industrial GDP growth, uh, you kind of get, you know, you get the same picture as with lights, uh, though more so, you see much more rapid growth in prefecture remainders relative to central cities. Okay. Um, and so this is some evidence that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of decentralization of this industrial activity. So this is population growth in, 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 a, in a map, and you see that these central cities are, are growing much more quickly uh, than, than the surrounding areas. Uh, and this is industrial GDP growth, and you see kind of the reverse, that the surrounding areas are much more darkly shaded than the central city areas. Okay. So for transport infrastructure, we're going to use maps that we've digitized from various years uh, and using the resulting digital, you know, the net resulting networks, we can construct various measures of the road and railroad networks, which, which are these, okay? And so we're gonna have specific indices for each of these things, which I'll lay out now, okay? So, for example, for the Beijing area, you know, we get a kind of, the map looks like this, and we can digitize it to look, at some, look like something like this. Um, and sometimes we have various classes of road, uh, so we, we tried a bunch of different, uh, we, we collect a bunch of different measures uh, so each of the measure indices I'm going to show you for various classes of roads. Uh, and so the first measure we, we build is the radial road capacity measure. And to do that, we draw rings 5 and 10 kilometers from the CBD. Um, and we count the minimum number of times the network crosses both of those rings, okay, to, to try to capture the amount of road capacity that uh, exists to travel from you know, somewhere within five kilometers of the CBD to somewhere beyond 10 kilometers of the CBD uh, in each city. I should say the CBD, we use the brightest light to, to identify, okay? And that seems to work pretty well. Uh, so th in this example, there are six radial roads, okay? To do ring road capacity, we draw rings uh, five and nine kilometers from the CBD, and then we draw rays out from the CBD at a 45 degree angle, say, look at this quadrant uh, as an example, and then we look at the number of times the network crosses each of these rays uh, within the two rings, okay? And we take the minimum of that, and we call that the ring capacity, okay? And so this is kind of a measure of uh, the, the capacity of the network to move uh, people and goods sort of from uh, this area of the city around the city to this area of the city here, okay? Um, and we can then repeat this for each of the four quadrants. Now, as you might imagine, the road network that existed in 1962 was not really oriented towards doing much rate, uh, ring or circumferential movement, and as a result, we kind of have very little, uh, it, it, it ends up being a, a little bit hard to predict this, um, and as a result, we're just gonna end up using it, uh, a dummy variable for whether there's any ring capacity at all. Um, it's actually true that today, most cities don't have much ring capacity either. Beijing's a notable exception. Okay, so just to give you a sense of how the network changed, uh, oops, uh, this is the expressway system, you know, it really filled out throughout the country uh, between uh, 1990 and 2010. Uh, and then the, it, there were railroads in 1990, and so that's gonna be an issue kind of econometrically for us. Uh, in addition, we don't observe on our maps kind of the quality of the railroads this, uh, in any way kind of similar to how well we observe the quality of the highways. So we're just gonna, you know, basically observe railroad or not. Um, and, you know, in 2005, the railroad network expanded some, um, uh, but by much less 
uh, than uh, for cities. And you know, in some sense, because we're using a national map to trace out these networks, uh, there may be a little bit of you know, whatever changes we find for railroads, some of it may be measurement error. So we want to think about that in the empirical work. Okay. Um, so we're going to, I, I kind of said this, we basically had 286 prefectures we start with. Uh, we lose some because they didn't have a suburban area and some because uh, we thought the central city was too small. And 88 of them involved central cities that were promoted to prefecture level cities. Okay. Uh, the same uh, sample for uh, manufacturing employment. For industrial GDP, we only have 241 cities because of data limitations. Okay, so how, what's the basic econometric kind of model, empirical model? Well, we kind of think about an Alonzo Muth Mills uh, standard urban economic model uh, set up like we saw earlier today several times. Uh, uh, in a model, so in a situation like that, we will kind of want to count uh, say population or economic activity in the central city uh, at time t uh, and ask uh, how that changes as we change the amount of uh, transport infrastructure r uh, holding the total amount of economic activity or population in the prefecture constant. Okay, so we, we're thinking about decentralization here. It's actually going to be almost the same as growth because this control doesn't, whether we put it in or not, doesn't matter at all, okay? Um, and then potentially uh, some controls that are gonna, uh, gonna influence urban form. Now, of course, if we have a good instrument for R, then it's gonna be randomized anyways, and so we don't need to worry about controls so much, okay? But to conceptualize this, we can think about doing this in two separate years and then first differencing. Uh, in these different years, because in 1990, the planning era might have had a different rule by which people were allocated across uh, uh, space uh, or production activity was allocated across space in cities, we might have different coefficients and different predictors. Okay, so that's reflected here uh, for 1990. Um, and then differencing the two equations, we get this, which has basically changes and initial levels in it. But since there was no highways in 1990, we're essentially going to assume the change in R for highways is the same as R for 2010. Okay? Uh, and then we have the other controls. Uh, and of course, we're still going to want, want to worry about exo getting exogenous variation in R, in RT, R 2010. Okay. Oops, going the wrong way. Okay, so uh, kind of to implement this, uh, we want to, you know, we, we want to not include post-1990 prefecture level outcomes um, because we're worried that they're, they're going to be endogenous. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to include 1990 and 1982 prefecture population as a robustness check, include the 1990 to 2010 prefecture population growth as a control. Uh, and we can instrument for that, but it is, turns out it doesn't matter either way. Then we want to have some controls for kind of the spatial structure of the, of the, of the prefecture, in particular the size of the central city. Um, we can do some robustness. And then, of course, if we have valid instruments, we'll talk about in a second, you know, basically uh, w we don't need to control for anything else. So it turns out our instrument, which is kind of the same network measures but calculated as of 1962 off of road and railroad networks that were oriented towards very different things, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be valid uh, conditional on uh, 1990 prefecture population, which is going to capture something about the scale. So places in 1962 had more roads because they were bigger. Bigger places in 1962 were also bigger in 1990. Uh, and also railroads in particular tended to serve manufacturing centers, which were provincial capitals, okay? So we want to control for both of those things. Um, we kind of think that those, you know, those things might be things that drive city growth 
subsequently, you know, in 1990 to 2010, or maybe related to them, and are correlated with the instrument, we don't think there are other things uh, that fall into that category. And so strictly, other things don't need to be controlled for in these regressions. The, yeah, so these are 1962 roads. They were definitely not highways. These were uh, typically unpaved, uh, single lane roads uh, that were used to transport agricultural goods from the nearby countryside to cities. Um, and so the idea is that these were kind of rights of way that could be upgraded at relatively low cost into highways, uh, but they were not, certainly not highways. And those same roads were in 1962? Uh, we don't have any data in 1962. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, oh, we could, we, we could have used. No, so you want to use as, as, as far lagged an instrument as you can, right? Uh, because you, you worried that... No, you know, it could be more complicated factors. Maybe the situations where we had more of these countryside or highway roads and more of a cultural revolution and one more people sent down and it had all these other effects. I'm just saying, going why go back so far in so, time and the same roads would have existed. So it doesn't, it really actually doesn't matter because the, the roads that existed in 1962 was almost the same as the roads that existed in 1990. Uh, and they were almost all unimproved. There were no highways. Uh, very little changed in sort of the infrastructure between those two years. Okay? So, you know, if, if you criticize one, you're criticizing the other. So, uh, but, you know, our hope is that by using uh, something that, that has a deep lag, you, you get rid of as many, uh, as, as many correlated unobservables as possible. Um, okay, so for railroads, uh, we have a little bit more of a challenge because railroads existed in 1990. And so for this, you know, basically we're going to argue that uh, in 1990, since there was almost no commuting, um, and there was this rural-urban legal separation, that is that, you know, these SOEs were, st were by law required to be in the cities, um, kind of we're looking at a baseline which was not a market allocation, and uh, after that, uh, the location of firms became uh, determined by the market, and so they could respond to the existing railroad infrastructure, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, you could make the same argument for highways, but I think the identification concerns are a little bit, uh, are a little bit more serious for railroads, though I think that what we're doing is plausible. Um, you know, I think there are two reasons to think that what we're doing with highways uh, is, uh, makes a lot of sense. I think there's only one reason to think how we're dealing with railroads makes, makes a lot of sense. Okay. Okay, so you know, highways were built to build, were built to serve growing cities. Uh, we should see that these cities are centralizing. Uh, then, because of the or it's there's a positive correlation there when in fact the reverse might be true. Okay, um, so cities with more railroads have more industry and maybe more pressure for industrial decentralization as a result. So uh, as a solution, we instrument with this 1962 network. As I said, you know, this is a very poor quality network, and basically these are rights of way that could be used. Um, it's very strongly correlated with the agricultural uh, population, agricultural productivity of the prefecture, which is also very strongly correlated with the 1990 total population of the prefecture. Okay. Um, so I should, uh, so yeah, so the rail network in 1962, where does it come from? You know, it's, it was developed for long distance shipping. It's not about uh, intercity travel, um, trade of industrial products. Um, it, was, it was sort of planned uh, for, uh, by the Soviets. 
uh, and the Japanese, uh, well, not all of it, but a large part of it. Um, and so, you know, we think it's unlikely to be related for, you know, to, to modern pressures for industrial decentralization in cities. Okay, so this first, the first stage, what do you see for radial highways um, in 2010 or 2005? They're strongly related to 1962 radial roads, but not related significantly to uh, other elements of the 1962 infrastructure. Um, they're also strongly related to provincial capital indicator and to prefecture population in 1990. Okay, so kind of from the first stage, you can see some evidence that these might be important controls. In particular, this is going to be the only important control. Okay, for the railroad, for, for radial railroads, you can see that's uh, predicted by 1962 radial railroads, but not 1962 radial roads or rings. Uh, and for uh, uh, rings, you can see that 1962 rings predicts uh, modern rings, but not the other elements of the network. Okay, so the first stage works in the way it should. It predicts the, uh, each element of the 1962 network predicts the element we want it to of the modern network. Um, so if you just run OLS of the change in log center city population, uh, 1990 and 2010, on the number of 2010 radial highways, I'll give you these controls in a second, you basically get close to zero, maybe a slightly negative coefficient. And I think there's two things going on here. One thing is that cities that built, up, built more highways were growing more quickly, and that's why they built more highways. And the highways were causing decentralization. Okay? And those two things are kind of offsetting. And so when you uh, instrument, and in particular, uh, you need to control for the, the 1990 prefecture population, uh, you get a coefficient of about minus 0.05, minus 0.06, uh, saying that each radial highway displaced about 6% of uh, central city population to urban peripheries. Um, and that's robust to, to additional controls. Okay, so, you know, you might say, hey, well, the specification you originally wrote down looks like this one, where you should control for the change in prefecture population 1990 to 2010. We can do that, and we, we instrument for it with a uh, 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 sort of card-type instrument, which is, the, which allocates people to prefectures based on historical migration flows, uh, and, and that, that works as an instrument, and you get a coefficient that's about the same, about minus 0.04. Uh, we can uh, try to control for the 1990 stock of radial roads, uh, which uh, uh, is, uh, doesn't change things significantly. It blows up the standard error. Um, we can try to use 2005 radial highways to get about the same. Um, and we can do uh, various sample selections. We find that you know, the results are really being driven by uh, the more dynamic cities in the central and east of the country uh, and not the, not the western part of the country. Okay. So we can also look at and see whether uh, there's any relationship between highways and changes in uh, uh, allocation of population between centers and, and prefecture remainders in the pre-reform period. Um, and you actually find the opposite sign. Uh, this is, once again, instrumenting with the 1962 network, and it turns out to be a very strong instrument here. Um, so there's definitely this shift, okay, that, you know, 1962 roads positively predicted uh, 1980 and 1990 roads and more, uh, more roads in 1962 predicted essentially more growth in these cities, uh, even control, you know, so more growth because we're controlling for uh, population, prefecture population in 1982. And then subsequent to that, they predict decentralization. So there's really this shift that happened after 1990 that I think uh, that, that you know, I, I think we can see here in the data. Okay. 
So other forms of infrastructure, basically, the only thing that matters is uh, ring roads. They also cause a lot of decentralization. Any sort of ring capacity caused, I don't know, 20 to 30 percent of central city population to decentralize. Uh, and that's in addition to the radial highways. Okay. So for production, um, I'm going to use industrial GDP, which has a coverage limit limitation, and then manufacturing employment. Okay. And it's really the same empirical setup. So uh, looking at highways you, for industrial GDP, you basically get nothing. Okay? However, for radial railroads, you get these big effects that are very consistent across specifications of about 26%. Uh, so saying that each radial railroad decentralized about 26% of industrial, uh, activ uh, industrial GDP to uh, suburban areas. Um, and that's regardless of what other elements of the transport infrastructure is, is accounted for. Okay? Um, now, the, uh, except for ring roads. Okay? So looking at ring roads, uh, you get an additional huge numbers with large standard errors, but something on the you know, order of 40, 50 percent. Okay? So, so th there's kind of some narrative that seems like it might be coming out here that for a lot of industrial production, it can move to the periphery, ship uh, you know, uh, output around ring roads to radial railroads for long distance shipping, okay? Which is the narrative of Meyer, Kane, and Wolf for the US as well, but I think hasn't really been uh, sort of demonstrated empirically um, uh, in a systematic way uh, to this point, okay? So how is it that this can all fit together, okay? So, you know, we have highways causing population decentralization. I think most of that is not really decentralization. Most of that is centralization that would have occurred but didn't occur because the highways were built, okay? Um, you have a lot of rural migrants that now, uh, instead of uh, having to move into the city proper, where they don't have hukou status, where they don't have the official right to live, uh, they can live at the periphery <clears throat> um, and either commute into the city or work on the periphery in these industrial uh, facilities that have decentralized uh, with railroads. Um, and, <coughs> uh, you know, I think what's key for this is that uh, the highways have not been particularly important for long distance transport except in a few industries. Okay? Railroads have, um, and it's just that you know, we've had this compositional change in the city uh, employment mix, where you've had this mix, this, this shift to business and financial services, and the separation uh, uh, that's gone along with this of, of living and work location, and uh, employment in industry of kind of a lot of rural migrants uh, who live at the periphery, whereas before they would have lived, they would have moved into the cities. Okay, so that's kind of the narrative that I think fits this, these results. Um, now I want to look at, finish with looking at industrial employment by sector. Um, and so looking at all industries, and here we have more data so we can look at all the full sample, we kind of find results that really mirror the results from uh, industrial GDP, uh, effects of almost the same point estimates, each radial railroad causing about uh, here 28% of 26% of industrial GDP to decentralize. Okay. Um, breaking it out into different types of <laughs> products, so you have, so Durantone and Turner uh, in their uh, paper about roads and trade, they break up products into various weight classes um, that have to do with how easy it is to ship by different modes. And so heavy weight 
uh, industries or heavyweight products um, are uh, uh, expensive to transship and typically you want to ship them long distance by rail. Uh, and so they don't seem to respond to anything, okay, to any element of the network. Whereas medium weight products respond to railroads or the location of their production facilities, but not, uh, maybe some to ring roads as well. Okay. And uh, high tech, which is very lightweight, responds to, to railroads uh, and ring roads. Okay. Um, electric, electrical, non-electrical machinery responds to railroads and maybe ring roads as well. And um, textiles, which is thought of as very footloose and gets, often gets shipped long distance by truck, responds to radial highways in addition to railroads. Okay? So there's kind of, um, you know, there's different types of production activity that can decentralize uh, in different ways uh, to different elements of the network uh, that we can pick up here. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is kind of do an accounting exercise and ask, well, if you take these estimates, how much of kind of, say, the 1990 population, uh, in addition, is accommodated by these Chinese urban areas, given the infrastructure that was built, okay? So this, so kind of, if you take these estimates, about 24% of the 19, uh, you know, on top of the 1990 population or 16% of the 2010 population, uh, in addition to what's, you know, what's already there or what was already there in these Chinese cities, these Chinese central cities can be accommodated because essentially the, si the, the, the new highways caused, allowed the city to grow spatially, okay? Um, so this is why I say transportation facilitates urbanization. I think it really does. Um, for industrial GDP, you get kind of bigger numbers uh, for 1990% for, for because basically uh, there was very much smaller industrial GDP in 1990, and you can do it with total GDP as well, which I didn't report those numbers, but um, that's, uh, that's, that's something you can do as well. Okay? Um, we can also think about different kind of, uh, you know, what, what would happen if we, uh, gave each city one additional radial highway uh, or you know, a ring road, stuff like that. And you could do some cal kind of counterfactual calculations of how much more uh, relative to say the 1990 aggregate population could be accommodated in these cities. Um, and you know, if you gave all cities a ring road, you, uh, once again, you, know, you, could, you could really accommodate a lot more population. Um, so, uh, obviously there's going to be kind of decreasing returns to this sort of thing, but our analysis is off of a base of zero. So I wouldn't, I, you know, if you have a city that already has five radial roads, I, you know, I wouldn't advocate taking these numbers. But if you have a city that starts off with zero, I think we can learn something here about kind of how much bigger the urban sector in a country can get because of the transportation uh, infrastructure because of some potential transportation infrastructure improvements. Okay, so conclusion, um, highways have significantly influenced population decentralization in China. Railroads have significantly influenced GDP decentralization. Ring roads have significantly influenced both. Um, as a result, Chinese cities have been able to accommodate a lot more population, and, and given there's been an, an enormous amount of uh, pressure for uh, urbanization in China, and you know all these uh, restrictions on uh, hukou restrictions on where people live, you know I think uh, any goal of trying to relax these is going to involve building enough infrastructure in cities to accommodate uh, all these new people. Um, in any case, it's been important for the growth of Chinese cities. Uh, and, and allowed them to accommodate all these new, uh, these new residents. Okay, thank you very much. We have some time for questions. 
Okay. Um, I'll start with Roger. I, I may have missed this, but I don't remember you mentioning vehicles at all. I mean, rolling stock, you know, locomotives, railroad cars, light trucks, heavy trucks, buses. And is it possible that in the in a case of a planned economy like this, you know, not very advanced stage, that the supply of these sorts of accompanying capital, either through local production or imports, would really make a difference? Or do you think the supplies are sort of automatically, as it were, increased? It's certainly not elastic. I think you're right. Um, so yeah, there was very data? little trucks or cars in 1990 in China. Um, you know, the only thing that roads were used for uh, was uh, besides sort of travel, you know, bicycle and walking travel within cities was uh, transport of agricultural goods from r agricultural areas to serve cities. And maybe some, a little bit of return of manufacturing goods out to the rural areas, but a surprising amount of that was done by you know, hand cart or animal power. You know, there were some trucks, but uh, by 1990, probably mostly truck, but certainly 10 years earlier, you know, you had all sorts of transport. But in order for that to occur, you still needed the road. Um, I, but I agree with locomotives, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I'm sure there was sort of a supply constraint there. Yeah, so. One of the illustrations Right. So, uh, yeah, so you've got to have a mechanism for, have, for you know, supplying the, uh, the modes in addition to the, to the infrastructure. Um, I mean, today, so the story about Beijing, right, is they build one ring road or they, they built the third ring road and six months later it was filled with cars. And so then they started work on the fourth ring road, right? So I think in China today, it's part of the world economy they can access these things. But I think in 1990, and I think that actually helps us for our you know, kind of identification, in 1990 that wasn't the case. Okay, so I had two questions. One is, you're assuming that these location decisions by people, but more importantly by firms, are market driven, which was not true in 1990, yeah. and only gradually became true for some industries by 2010. Even now, substantially, uh, you know, not the majority, but uh, if, you know, larger than you might think share of industrial output comes from state-owned firms yep. who are told where to locate, right? So I think you should at least disaggregate by which industries actually are market-driven decisions if you want to look at this, because otherwise the state might be deciding the location of the highway and the location of the factory independent, I mean, together. together. It's not that one is responding to the other, these are decided jointly. Mm -hmm. And which is my second question, you know, if you look at your regressions, you're looking at population growth between 1990 and 2010, and you're regressing it on the stock of highways in 2010, right? And you're instrumenting with this and that, but you know, Shouldn't you, if you look, want to predict population growth, shouldn't you be looking at the baseline level of highways? It seems odd to look at the right-hand side as the end period. I mean, when you look at standard growth regressions, does education cause growth? People look at education at the beginning of the growth period. Yeah, not so there's the a question end. of whether you want to think about a static equilibrium and then differencing it, or whether you want to think in a growth uh, kind of framework, right? Um, and so basically, we can't look in a growth framework. Well, we, could, we can, and we'll find uh, basically a zero uh, because, I mean, the roads that existed in 1990 are, and you sort of are totally irrelevant uh, to what exists today, you know? And people drive on what exists today and not what yeah, exists today. Yeah, but then you can't have an instrumentation strategy because your reduced form is regressing growth on that initial level in No, but that initial level is, core, is, 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 re is related much more to what exists today than uh, what exists in 19... So 
pe people use what exists today, and the uh, instrument, sort of the number of roads that existed in the city is, uh, you know, it's related to the highways that exist today. So that's, you know, that if, if you think about, you know, what people are using today, that's, that's what's relevant. That's fine, but what people are using today is determined by demand as well. I mean, just like you gave the example of the, rail ro of the ring roads in Beijing. This is the endogeneity you're trying to get around. Why are there five ring roads in Beijing? Because people wanted more. Yeah, so, and, and when we predict that, we only predict that there is one, or uh, I right, think one. Right, but that's what I'm saying. If you don't have a reduced significant coefficient on a reduced form, how can you claim that you have a causal estimate? So when you're doing your IV estimate, your reduced form is growth on that initial whatever, 1962 or whatever it is. Yeah, so actually I don't know what that is offhand. So I don't have yeah, it on Yeah, but we can talk about it later. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you for this great discussion.